Today we're gonna discuss ethical consumption based on the book Ethical Consumption, a Critical Introduction by Tanya Lewis and Emily Potter and we're gonna answer the questions what does it involve and what's wrong with it. To start, we have to talk about political consumerism and how it laid the path for eth ethical consumption. While the mainstream of ethical consumption is a reasonably recent phenomenon, it can clearly be linked to a range of longer-term struggles around consumer politics. One sure commonality that marks the various practices and concerns framed within the ethical consumer turn is the growing politicization of life and lifestyle practices. It is such that ethical consumption has contributed to the rise of consumer organizations that emerge around the issue of political consumerism, and they seek to promote the ethical use of consumer power. And there are clearly strong links between ethical consumption, which has to do with the problematization of living and responsible consumption, and political consumerism, which has traditionally been associated with forms of activism, such as boycotts and consumer organizations. So some examples of boycotts, so for instance, the US white label campaign of 1899. So this was one of the more important and earliest examples of organized political campaigning around. Um, this was essentially around consumption with the U.S. White Label Campaign of 1899. So this was driven by the National Consumer Leagues that had first developed in the U.K. in the late 19th and subsequently spread to the U.S. and Europe. It was initially by middle-class women concerned with the conditions of workers. They worked to compile white as opposed to black lists of products in department stores associated with good labor practices. Next up we have Nestle, uh, one of the more recent boycotts and the first case of global brands um, based activism was the targeting of Nestle by various consumer church and also act action groups in response to their marketing of infant formula in Africa and Asia, which they pursued despite medical research which pointed to its associations and with higher infant mortality when compared with breast milk. Nestle also signaled the shift towards a different kind of political activism around consumerism and therefore was targeted because it was highly visible corporation with a very strong brand presence. And so this also follows what Klein explains in her book, No Logo, and this was made in 2000. The mainstreaming of political consumerism today is integrally connected to the centrality of brand culture. So the rise of branding as a corporate strategy and the growing presence of corporate brands in everyday life has shifted or enabled the shift towards an everyday mode of ethical consumerism and what we call mainstream of ethical consumption. So, moving on to brand culture. One important context for the ethical turn in mainstream consumerism has clearly been the increased focus within popular media culture on the impact and risks of capitalist modernity, particularly in relation to the environment. Let's moving on to greenwashing. Marketers and advertisers have been quick to jump on the green bandwagon, increasingly embracing the language of corporate responsibility and incorporating green rhetoric and imagery into media marketing strategies. A trend that has in turn seen rising concerns about corporate greenwashing. Closely linked to and overlapping with environmental critiques of modernity, a range of critical commentaries on materialism and affluenza in wealthy developed nations. The first example we have for greenwashing is Fiji Waters. Fiji water has been part of many greenwashing controversies since the early 2010s. The company constantly claims to be environmentally friendly, when in reality their production line is mostly automized. They receive major cutbacks on electricity costs from the Fiji government, willingly or forcefully depending on the times, and ship their products across the globe while still claiming to be carbon negative. And finally, America's favorite supermarket chain, Walmart. Over the past years, Walmart has proclaimed to go green with a sustainable campaign. However, according to the Institute for Local Reliance, Walmart's sustainability campaign has done more to improve the company's image than the environment. Walmart still only generates 2% of US electricity from wind and solar resources. According to the IRS, Walmart routinely donates money to political candidates who vote against the environment. The retail giant responded to these accusations by stating that it is serious about its commitment to reduce 20 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions by 2015. As we have noted, it is hard to draw a clear definition online around the phenomenon of ethical consumption within contemporary culture. 
Now the work on ethical consumption is starting to emerge from a range of disciplines, from the field of consumption studies, which explains the growing symbolic role of consumption and of a broader estelized lifestyle culture through which one experiences and confirms identity, all the way to geography. In the field of geography, the global culture and political contexts to which alternative and political consumers practices inevitably speak clearly point to the relevance of forms of analysis that emphasize questions of space and place. These analyses frame such questions in terms of a range of interconnected concerns around the politics of post- and neocolonialism and global economics, as well as the non-representational and more-than-human politics. Geographers have brought a range of different critical lenses to questions of ethical consumption, but one of their primary contributions has been to map what has been called the commodity chain, that is to expose the connections between production processes and consumption practices and the various activities, relations and politics in between. In the context of globalized commodity production, the growing length of commodity chains and the increasing disconnection between consumers and producers Geographic approaches are becoming crucial to understanding the complex relations underpinning consumption today. So next up and finally we have political theory and this is the understanding of everyday consumption practices as a space of politics and citizenship brings us to debates concerning civic culture and political citizenship. As we have already noted, one important context for the mainstreaming of political and ethical forms of consumerism is the emergence of diverse forms of citizenship under neoliberalism. These include consumer-oriented modes of citizenship, and this was quoted by Miller in 2007, and also ecological or sustainable forms of citizenship. The refiguring of consumption as a site of ethical and political engagement has been regarded suspiciously by some of the classic characteristic of advanced, neo, um, advanced liberal governance, in which civic responsibility is refrained in terms of individual choice, self-realization, and the stakeholder society. And this is at the expense of state care and conventional understandings of civic participation and citizenship. In the past two decades, the green consumer has become an increasingly popular concept, with government initiatives over the past decade targeting consumers as informed, calculative agents through domestically based campaigns such as reduce, reuse and recycle, thereby privileging the home as a site of political, cultural change. So where does this leave the role of the individual in relation to the ethical consumption? Can we say that ethical consumption is an individualistic form of politics, a mean through which neoliberal governments encourage consumers to become responsibilized? Or is it a zone of democratic potential, engaging people in places and ways that conventional politics cannot reach? Some researchers argue that the individual is burdened with an overwhelming rather than partial responsibility for charge which is what scholars call responsabilization. In these terms, ethical consumption is a system of a profoundly individualistic society in which individuals are being presented with both the opportunity of and responsibility for tackling a number of deep-rooted social problems like poverty, exploitation, mass industrialization, pollution, through their purchasing decisions in a world in which we are encouraged to shop for change. So without a doubt, ethical consumption is an increasingly popular way of making a political statement and slash or constituting a sense of the moral self. But we should ask, what's wrong with ethical consumption? So we can foreground its problems, its failures, and its inability to live up to the promise of its name. So now we're going to tell you about the wrong side of ethical consumption. A recurrent theme within both popular and scholarly discussions of ethical consumption is its bourgeois connotations, which journalist George Monbiot warning in a 2007 article that ethical shopping is in danger of becoming another signifier of social status. This raises the question, is ethical consumption mainly used as a high-end status pursuit for the maniite classes, a panacea for middle-class guilt? The democratic nature of consumer-based politics, the notion that all consumers have free choice, continue to be undermined by the recognition of the class barriers to consuming the right goods, such as access to organic produce. Barriers that are not just economic, but related to the kind of class dispositions or cultural capital and forms of taste people bring to their consumption practices. 
Many commenters have pointed out that ethical consumption is not a fully particularly democratic mode of political engagement, in that it only gives votes to those people who have enough financial and social cap to buy the products in question. It is not available to everybody. The next problem is over monetization or profitization of ethical consumption. This involves examples such as going to a thrift store, finding a couple of pieces, then reselling them on an app called Depop for 10 times the amount the thrifter paid for them. Therefore, the demand to go thrifting shifts away from an ethical effort to more of a profit maximizer effort. The next question is, is ethical consumption always sustainable consumption? Furthermore, we can see a contradiction with the overconsumption of ethical products. Buying 10 expensive organic t-shirts from American Apparel is for instance an opposite lifestyle practice to deciding to radically downshift your consumption and not buying any new clothes at all, which is more ethical and sustainable. In today's world, we can see different examples of the wrong side of ethical consumption. For instance, we have Black Friday, which is a normalized form of overconsumption that happens every year in around November, which encourages people to overconsume and buy products for a lesser price. We can even see that Black Friday has extended into different days, such as Cyber Monday, and also a whole week rather than just a Friday. Next, we have Sarah and H&M as an example of fast fashion. These brands encourage people to overconsume just because the products are cheaper and rather than in different stores that have better practices or are more sustainable. These stores also release new clothes every two weeks, which encourages people to keep track of these new styles, new trends, and therefore also encouraging our consumption. Next up we have TikTok trends and this could be seen in like influencers and trends toward ethical consumption and also vice versa. So for instance there's a lot of really famous influencers that have a very young fan base such as Sienna May, uh, Charlie D'Amelio and they do try and persuade their fan base to go ethically consume, go to a black owned business um, etc. Do not uh, go to Starbucks so much. Try and stray away from the, the stores that do not fare well um, in ethics. Next up on the other side you have people uh, doing hauls. So they'll do Shein hauls, Romwe, uh, Zara, etc. Basically what Safel just talked about before. And it's basically this overconsumption showing your fans, okay this is what I got for whatever $50. You guys can do it too, here's the code, here's my affiliate link, you follow that and then you also help me out. So essentially they're making money off of over consuming and then usually at the end of the day the items probably just get sold on Depop anyways. So rise of Amazon and EU antitrust laws against Amazon. So the introduction of Amazon into our daily lives has been a sort of polarizing subject. Um, on one hand you can literally open up your phone, scroll through a few pages, and pick up basically any item that is available in today's market and have it shipped to you in two, three days. Amazon's core ideology rests upon the idea of consumption. By increasing availability and ease of consumption, the client is compelled to consume daily rather than weekly. This consumption is furthermore laid on the backs of low-income workers that work at their facilities and those who make their products. On the other hand, we have also seen different solutions that have come up with this overconsumption over the years. We have seen that there are different organizations that are trying to mark the companies that are ethical or sustainable. So we have seen the rise of the fair trade organization which labels companies or products as fair trade which means that they pay their workers fairly and also have ethical practices in their whole system. We have seen different certifications also with the Rainforest Alliance that labels chocolate as fair trade as well and then we've also seen the rise of fashion revolution which targets fast fashion and the companies that don't follow good practices or ethical and sustainable practices. So to sum up Different forms of ethical consumption can either promote inequalities of wealth or also contribute to a level of change towards forms of equality, whether environmental, mental or social. Since the quality of life has improved over the years since the Industrial Revolution, our consumption has increased and capitalism has thrived. Well, 
We find ourselves driving the economy with our overconsumption. Company giants own even the companies that seem ethical, therefore making it hard for a consumer to be fully ethical and stop supporting the major capitalists that promote unfair and unethical practices. An inherent problem to the ethical consumption will always be the producers that inevitably encourage consumption and make it more convenient and attractive. At least, if we have the power to vote for ethical practices with our product choices, we should do so.